pray and we'll uh, continue. Good. Father, thanks so much for this morning or uh, <laughs> this evening. <laughs> we just thank you so much for your glory and grace to us, Lord, morning and evening. And we just pray that you will bless our story, be glorified, study and be glorified through it as we continue uh, thinking about prayer. And we uh, ask you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, I've already gotten tongue-tied twice just in the prayer, so uh, we'll see how it all goes. But uh, come on in. I estimate, and my estimate could be over generous, but I estimate the prayer study will be tonight and next week, possibly another, possibly tonight and another two weeks, just depending on how long a few things take. But uh, tonight we're just gonna um, we're gonna finish up talking about some of the things the Bible instructs us to pray for, and then uh, if we finish that tonight, and then uh, then next week we will start talking about what are called uh, hindrances to prayer, uh, some some biblical clues if our prayers just aren't getting answered. So these are uh, the agenda items. And uh, so we already talked uh, about this passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2, but I would like you to go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, because uh, the first thing we're talking about tonight about prayer is that the Bible uh, asks us to pray for our leaders. And we talked last week, we were talking about prayer for the lost, which 1 Timothy 2 definitely is dealing with. But among the different things it talks about is, uh, is our leaders. Let me just read this again to get us back, back in the, um, the 1 Timothy 2 uh, mindset. I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, and intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and for those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. So let me just uh, focus on verse 2 there a little bit. Praying for kings and all of those who are in authority over us. It says who to pray for, and it says why. And so I want to develop that a little bit. Now, obviously, in our nation, we don't have a monarchy. We don't have kings. We have a, a president, senators, congress, uh, mayors, governors, that sort of thing. Some of, these, uh, some of these roles crossed over in the Roman Empire. They did have senators, and they did have governors. Uh, some do not. But I think we could, uh, we could say what the Bible says about kings would... Uh, would apply to any world leader or predominant leader of a nation, including a president in our case. Uh, it definitely, though, with the, with the, for all those in authority over you, it would be inclusive of all government officials. And so the Bible uh, commands us to pray for them. As we, <coughs> as we talked about before, it is in a context of a prayer for the lost, and uh, it, it's interesting. I think uh, if we were to say the kinds of things we should pray, the first and foremost would be that if we don't believe a leader knows the Lord, we would pray for them to get saved, that they would come to know the Lord. But whether they know the Lord or not, we would ask God to allow them to lead wisely and justly. Those probably would be the two main things we would want to ask for. So, for instance, here in uh, the United States of America, our, our president is President Biden, we would ask that God will allow President Biden to, to, to get saved, but to lead the nation wisely and justly. When President Trump was president, hopefully we were praying the same thing for him. This doesn't matter what a person's political party is. Some of this is rooted in how God uses governments and world leaders in the world. Now, I think all of us know perfectly well all of us know perfectly well that governments are not always just. There are governments uh, that, that, are, that are unjust, and most governments are unjust to some degree. You know, uh, but even in that context, God has seen fit to give us leaders, and God's, God's sovereign will, God's wisdom tells us that even an unjust government is better than no government. Go ahead, Holly. Yeah, and that wasn't going on. Uh, Holly mentioned how they used to sacrifice Christians in the Colosseum. Go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, so let me talk about that a little bit because that is so relevant to this. Because, and let me tell you why it's relevant and then we'll, we'll work our way to it. And I'll read you something really interesting. When Paul, when the Apostle Paul was writing this uh, in 1 Timothy, when, Paul, when the Apostle Paul was writing most of his letters, the Roman emperor was a guy named Nero. Nero wasn't a very nice guy. He was not a just ruler. He was not a godly ruler. And in fact, most of the things the New Testament says about submitting to your, your kings and government authorities were written when Nero was the emperor. And that is, that is astounding. Now, when Paul wrote something I'm going to read you in a minute, Nero wasn't killing Christians yet. But, but here's the thing. God knew he was going to. And here's the principle the Bible gives us. And this is an important point. The Bible tells us and this is one of the reasons we should pray for our leaders. The reason Titus says we should pray for them is so that we can live a peaceful lives, peaceful and quiet lives of godliness and holiness. Now, so the Bible, the goal for praying for our leaders is we can live peaceful and quiet lives of godliness and holiness. Now, it's a lot easier to, uh, if anyone wants to disagree with me, feel free. But it's a lot easier to live a peaceful and quiet life when you're not in an arena with a lion about to attack you, right? It's a little easier to live a peaceful and quiet life. Or if you're not, let's say, uh, you know, sitting in a big bat of boiling oil or uh, being burned at the stake or, uh, you know, nailed to a Roman cross, any number of things. It's a lot easier to live a peaceful and quiet life when those things aren't going on. So one of the reasons we pray for our leaders is in the hope that persecution will not be as bad as it might be if we didn't pray for them. Persecution, killing people because of their religion, whatever their religion, but ours is the right one. <laughs> My Facebook friends are going to turn over in their graves even though they're still alive, some of them, but ours is the right one. It is the true one. The Christian faith is the true faith. Persecuting it is not right. It's not just. But religious persecution is not just. So when we pray that they will be just and wise, part of it is so that they won't persecute us. But yeah, Holly, during, during, Paul, during Paul's uh, most of his ministry, at least a lot of his ministry, Nero was the emperor. The reason that's important is because one of the reasons God tells us to pray for our leaders is the Bible tells us that he's put them over us. And a lot of times we don't like this, especially if it's a leader we don't like. Let me read you something from Romans 13. I'm going to go to Romans chapter 13 and verse 1 to 7. And this fits into why we pray for our leaders, as you will probably guess. Um, it's going to mention the emperor, and the emperor is that Nero I mentioned. So here we go. <clears throat> Romans 13, 1 to 7 says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. Those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword in vain, or for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This also is why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. All right. Nero's emperor and Paul says it, and that's really hard for a lot of people to swallow. Because one, a lot of rulers do really bad things. And two, in the United States of America, we love our politics so much that if you're a Democrat, you hate the guy, you hate the president if he's a Republican. And if you're a Republican, you hate the president when he's a Democrat. So I notice among my Democrat friends that they love Romans 13 when a Democrat's in office. 
and my Republican friends love Romans 13 when a Republican's in office, and then it's like, uh, it's almost like, let's just take the white out to that passage until we get another one of our guys in there. But in God's sovereignty, what he's telling us is that while governments are not perfect, a government is better than no government. How many of you guys know what the word anarchy means? What's anarchy, Holly? Chaos and rebellion. But uh, let, me, let me flesh that out a little more specifically. The Greek word for ruler is arche. Uh, arche means ruler, and a, or a or on, is, a, is a, what we call a negative prefix, and it means something like no or none. A, narche, a, narche, it means no ruler. We got no ruler. I remember, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the old Lion King cartoon. I haven't seen the live action one yet, but there's this time where, uh, you know, it's like they're talking about killing Mufasa, who's the, you know, the lion, the, the, and, and the hyenas are like, you know, good idea. Who needs a king? No king, no king, la, 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 la. And then Uncle Scar's like, you know, idiots, there will be a king. Anyways, but all this to say, when there's no... Anarchy is no king, no king, la, 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 or no government, whatever. And I have a lot of friends who kind of have this idea that if we, if we were in an anarchy situation, wouldn't that be great? Because then we'd all do what we wanted. But here's the problem. When you're in an anarchy situation, everybody does do what they want. But it's not that I should have watched this movie, but I watched this movie called The Purge. And in The Purge, in one night of the year, people can do whatever they want to other people, right? Mm -hmm. So there's like a 24-hour period where you can, it's called the purge, where you like, you can kill people if you want and whatever. But that's like, on, anarchy is like the purge, but all the time. People who don't like somebody, and, and what, that, what, what you eventually get is you get, you know, you get bands of thugs who do nasty, violent things. It's, it, it creates a horrible situation, and even an imperfect government is better than anyone on the street can do whatever they want to you, because there's no law, no ruler, Go ahead, Holly. I was just thinking of the situation Mm-hmm. They don't have like a governor or a president or anything. They just can't find somebody to like administer the problem. Mm-hmm. All this drama and then they eat that person. Yeah. Oh, it's a it's a good example. It's, it's a good example because eating somebody is about, but, but, but right, if there's no ruler, then if you're strong enough and have enough buddies to, your gang can beat somebody else's gang and there's no king or ruler, I mean, it, it's kind of gross, but you can eat people if you want to. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's icky and horrible. I'm just saying that's why God's given us governments. They're unjust and they might persecute Christians, but it's better than just. What you guys said, chaos, disorder, evil, pandemonium, that's what you get when there is no ruler. So it says God established the rulers, and they are God's servants. But we know even among Christians, you and I are Christians, and even we don't always serve God the way we would. Our non-believing rulers aren't always going to, and that's part of the reason we, uh, we pray for them. Um, now, there is one exception I want to mention, because it says, we, it says we're, we're required to obey our rulers. And rulers have laws about a lot of things the Bible doesn't talk about, right? Stopping at stop signs. As far as I know, there were no stop signs in ancient Rome or Jerusalem. Um, we have to obey their laws, even if they're not specifically in the Bible. And I have a lot of Christians who don't like to pay... Uh, I have a lot of Christians. The Lord has a lot of Christians. I know a lot of Christians who, man, they hate paying taxes worse than anything in the world. Oh, taxation is theft. What's the Bible tell us? I mean, I don't like to pay taxes, but the Bible tells us that, yeah, if they tell us we're supposed to pay taxes, we're supposed to pay taxes. Jesus said that, Paul says it right here in Romans 13. There is one exception to when we don't obey rulers, and this is in Acts chapter 2, uh, uh, pardon me, Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. So you can turn over to Acts 5, 29 if you want. And as we turn there, the exception, the time we don't have to obey our rulers is when disobeying, or when obeying the ruler would mean disobeying God. What this means is, if you have a conflict where to obey the ruler you would have to disobey God, then you obey God instead. 
And usually that has to do with whether you're going to share your faith or share the gospel. Um, so Acts chapter 5, this is where Peter and, and the other apostles are commanded by the authorities in Jerusalem that they're not supposed to tell people about Jesus. They're not supposed to preach the gospel. They're not supposed to tell people how to get saved. And Peter says in Acts 5.29, the apostles, in fact, all of the apostles said, we must obey God rather than human beings. Or your, your translation might say, we must obey God rather than man. And the point there is, if there's ever a conflict between obedience to God and obedience to, to your governing authorities, you obey God. But if there's not, you obey the governing authorities. If the law tells you don't run a stop sign, you may disagree, but you don't run the stop sign. Go ahead, Holly. Uh, yes, uh, excellent, excellent question of, of, of obeying God rather than man, or, yeah, okay, so let me give you a couple. As a Christian, what, what would be a situation where we would say we must obey God rather than man? I pray, hopefully we'll pray for our leaders that this doesn't happen. But at some point, our government might, might make a law, much like the Pharisees in ancient Jerusalem, hey, you're not allowed to try to convert people to your faith. You're not allowed to tell people, preach your gospel to people. You're not, they call it proselytizing. You're not allowed to proselytize. You're not allowed to evangelize what you consider to be the lost. And if they say that, so like Andrea and I, sometimes we will go out at Crawley Square or Mass Park, because you know, it's Antia, and we'll, we'll pass up these gospels of dawn, and if we have the opportunity, we might talk to somebody about, hey, let me tell you how you can be saved. Um, the government may decide they don't want us to do that. And they may make a law, but God commands us, go and make disciples of all nations. So we're going to obey God rather than man. Um, and so that would, be, that would be one example. In a lot of countries, that's true. Um, I keep talking about, and one of these days we're going to watch it um, here at the church, this, this uh, documentary called The Insanity of God, and it's a documentary where this, this uh, gentleman goes around, he interviews all of these pastors from persecuted churches, and in a lot of them, these guys have gone to jail because they gave somebody a Bible, or even, even they found a Bible on their possession, right? It, and so um, if that happens, you and I have had it pretty easy for most of our lives. I, you know, we, we can carry our Bible around. I usually read my Bible on my phone so I don't usually carry it around, but I used to have, I still have it in the church library, this big, wonderful, leather-bound, Schofield Bible. And before I, you know, read the Bible on my phone like a modern man, I used to carry around this big, gigantic Bible that had me lopsided, you know, and, and uh, I never got arrested for it. People weren't like, hey, you can't carry that. If that happens, though, we obey God rather than man. Um, another thing, okay, so this is kind of for me. As a pastor, as a biblical studies professor, it's possible that they may say, if you teach that you believe that being a homosexual is a sin, that is hate speech. They might say that. Now, I don't hate homosexuals. I have, I have friends who are homosexuals who are not believers, but I'm a Bible teacher. I'm a pastor, and the Bible does teach that that's wrong. The Bible teaches that, that we're all sinners and God needs to deliver us from our sin and save us, but it does teach that, along with lying and cheating and stealing and, and any number of other things, that is a sin. So if the government ever tells me, hey, if you say that's a sin, that's hate speech, and you can't say that, but I'm preaching a, a sermon series on Romans or 1 Corinthians, and I go through one of the passages that says that, I'm going to preach what it says, even though I may go to jail for it. Obey God rather than man. Um... We could probably think of other examples if we thought long enough, but those are... Hmm. Yeah. Well, here's the rub. Yeah. Yeah. That's not that crazy. That's not that crazy. They, they have laws like that in China where you can only have two children and, and you're and right. So let's let's say let's say you have two children. It's a really good example, Holly. You have two children, but the government 
communism takes over or whatever it is, whatever regime, and they say you can only have two children, and you're a married person and you get pregnant a third time. Yeah, the government might tell you you have to abort the baby and you have to find, you, you would try to find a secret way to keep the baby alive because the Bible tells us we don't, we, we, we don't kill babies. I mean, you would be like the, uh, yeah, like the basket lady. Thank you. That's exactly what I was going to. But that, you know, that, that one phrase carries so much. Claudia, were you, oh, I, I thought I saw, I was like, I see that hand, brother. <laughs> Go ahead. Mm -hmm. What about, like, what about things like if the government says you cannot control breast milk? Yeah. Or like there's some people that want to make it illegal for people like to be homeless. Right. And stuff like that. Yeah. So you, you would still like feed people and then love immigrants and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. The government says and I, 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 ex excellent point because uh, because. Some people who would watch this video might be, you know, their, their sympathies might be more with one political side than the other, and we don't want to, we don't want to, we don't want to be too exclusive because any political side might ask you something. And as as she pointed out, yeah, the Bible commands us to feed the hungry. If they make city laws against feeding the homeless, we'll obey God rather than man. We will, we will feed the hungry. And some cities do do stuff like that. I mean, if you think that's crazy. It's crazy, but they do it. Um, if they make city, if they, if somebody's come here as a refugee from a war-torn country and they tell you, you have to report them to the police, but God says, love the stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And I know you and I weren't, but our, you know, spiritual forefathers were, the Israelites were. If God says, love the stranger, and the government says, no, treat the stranger like you don't belong here. We obey God rather than man. Really, another really good example. So uh, one of the things we want to do is we want to let God's word purify us. And that might mean we have to rub a lot of political entities the wrong way. Because I understand that most people who go to any given church or would listen to this online, most people in our country are either a Republican or a Democrat. And fair enough. You're a Republican or you're a Democrat. And, 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 and between you and the Lord, vote your conscience and all of that. But God is not a Republican and God is not a Democrat. Right? He's not any of those. God says that when Jesus comes to earth and Jesus is the king of the world, everything's going to be great. And until then, you got to take everybody with a little scrutiny and a little grain of salt. So, uh, all right, you got me going. We're talking about prayer, but uh, it fits. So pray for your leaders because we want them to be uh, obedient to God as much as they may be. All right, what time is it? Little more. We might not get through all of the notes I have for tonight, which is good because these are good discussions. But the next thing, uh, the next thing we're going to talk about that we pray for is other believers. Last week we talked about how we are supposed to pray for the lost. Now we're going to talk about how we are supposed to pray for the saved. Now, some of the things we would pray for, and we'll look for a couple. We'll look at a couple of examples. But we would uh, we would pray for other believers when they have a need, the same way we would pray for our own needs. We would pray for them when they're sick. We would pray for them uh, to grow spiritually. And let me focus on a few of those. Go go to James chapter five, the book of James in the New Testament, chapter five. Kind of close to the back. If you find Hebrews, James is right after Hebrews. And chapter 5 is right after chapter 4. Good thing I'm here to tell you guys these things. <laughs> uh, 5, and we're going to begin uh, with um, actually uh, verse 13. Verses 13 to 16. Yeah, you want to read that for us, Holly, if you wouldn't mind? Prayer offered in faith will be the sixth person of the 
You know, when I said stop at 16 in Hollywood, why don't we throw on Elijah? So go ahead with verses 17 and 18 if you don't mind. A lot of stuff there, a lot of bullet points, but let's focus on the prayer aspect. So first he says, if any of you are in trouble, pray. Then it talks about, is anybody sick? Now, sick here could mean one of two things. It could mean that you are physically sick because you, you have an illness. Or it could mean that you are spiritually sick, maybe heart sick. Maybe you have some sort of a sin difficulty you're having a hard time overcoming, or you're under intense spiritual warfare. So, I think it can encompass either of those, but there's two dimensions here. One, it gives kind of a prescriptive thing about if you're really having trouble and, and, and you really are having a hard time overcoming something, you can get your church leaders involved. It says, call the elders. Now, elder is a synonym for pastor, and here at High Point, I'm kind of the only pastor but if you you know claude and i would probably come together and if you're really sick we might come to your house and put some oil on your head and and pray for you to get better maybe we'll get nick involved in that i don't know you know we'll, we'll broaden the definition of elders but we're, we're willing to do that and that's kind of a, a formal way of doing this but then he goes on to, and says confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed and healed here could mean uh, could mean physically it could mean spiritually or you're under some spiritual bondage or oppression that they need god's deliverance from and that's general it's not just it's not just the elders it's not just that we can do this formal thing where we anoint somebody with oil and pray over them we can do that and that's that's a good thing to do but we should all be praying for one another now when it says confess your sins to one another what it doesn't mean is that Every Sunday you have to get up and tell and, and you know spill it all out for everyone. It's not talking about Catholic confession and it's not talking about to one another like, okay, I'm gonna tell you guys everything I did this last week. What it means to confess your sins to one another is a couple of things. One, if you sinned against somebody, you need to confess that to the person you sinned against. And if you have what we might call a besetting sin, a sin that you feel like you can't get over that you're just not you're not able to get past you might need to find a trusted friend a believer that you can talk to about this so they can know about it and so they can join you in praying about it so it doesn't mean that you do what we talk about airing your dirty laundry in front of everyone it doesn't mean that but it does mean that we need to recognize god has given us a christian community where we need to pray for one another in our culture, if we would right, be right with the question, in our culture sometimes we, we have this thing, and it, it's a way of doing this. We talk about like accountability partners, um, people who are in our lives that we can tell about some sins we're struggling with so they can pray for us and pray with us. Go ahead, Holly. Hmm, a lot. Uh, the question was, what does the Bible say about exorcism? I'm going to I'm going to give you the short answer. I actually, we're actually going to have a, a sermon about one of these on Sunday. So uh, I guess you probably have to work, but I'll, I'll send you a link for it um, on my YouTube, so I can get famous when you, you know, click the video 50 times. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm just kidding. But um, okay. One of the things we see in the Bible a lot, especially in the Gospels, is we see a lot of demonic possession. Bible believers, we believe that happens, and we believe that. In the name of Jesus, we, when somebody is demonically possessed, we command the evil spirit in the name of Jesus to come out of them. And generally, that's the way that's going to work. But and, I, and I'm just going to level with you about what the Bible says. because We're in Mark chapter 9, and we're going to be talking about this one exorcism where 
there's this boy that Jesus' disciples just can't cast out the demon. Now Jesus, because he's Jesus, he casts out that demon no problem. But then the disciples are like, Lord, why couldn't we cast it out? And he says, well, this kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. Um, now, what that tells me is that I, can, I will call upon a demon or an evil spirit in the name of Jesus as they come out of them if someone is demonically possessed. But there might be a situation where you have, I, I hate to say it this way, but you might have a clingy demonic spirit that you might need to pray over someone and pray for somebody a lot. You might even need to uh, fast. Fast means that you, you go without a meal or go without some meals and, and your concern for the person as a way of kind of communicating to God that you take this very seriously. I don't know about you guys, but I take eating very seriously. So when I, when I fast, I know the Lord knows that whatever I've got on my mind and whatever I'm praying about, I'm taking that seriously because I am giving the breakfast burritos a rest here, you know. So anyway, all that to say, Holy, so that's a quick synopsis. But if you read the Gospels and, and the book of Acts, you will see demons getting cast out. Yeah, I want to I want to say yes, but I want to clarify because of the reason I say this is because some of our Bible teachers, Lord love them, and He does, get a little carried away, and so the reason I say that, and the same thing happened in the days of Jesus and the apostles. Make sure you 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 put your categories. Your spiritual warfare categories need to be discerned from Scripture. And that means that we, we don't know, we don't know whether, like, like, like in the ancient world, and even you'll see this sometimes today, there were these non-biblical books, these books written by guys, but they weren't books in the Bible. And they would talk about things like the headache demon or the elbow pain demon. That's not, it sounds like a joke, but it's not. That was called the Testament of Solomon. I'll give you, I, I have a secret. Solomon didn't really write it. But, um, however, the key we have, I would, look, look, the biblical metaphor, Holly, is not key. The biblical metaphor is armor. I know this is a little bit left field of prayer and yet not too far. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about how we bolster ourselves against spiritual attack and spiritual warfare. And this would also mean that if we are in a place where we're going to be encountering people who are possessed by demonic spirits, and don't think it can't happen. It happens. Even in our scientifically oriented culture here in the West, it happens. All right, I am in Ephesians chapter 6. And this is probably the key we're talking about. If it's not, I don't know, it should be. <laughs> uh, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Let me stop for a minute. We are not powerful. You and I are not powerful, all right? We are strong in his power. I was hearing a preacher talk about Samson the other day, and some people get this idea of Samson as though he was, uh, you know, this big, buffed-out Israelite walking around looking like the, the Israelite Arnold Schwarzenegger. Samson was probably no bigger than, you know, you or me. He was probably just an average Israelite, but when God worked on him, when the Spirit of God came on him, he could rip apart chains and carry city gates and, you know, kill a thousand people with a jawbone, right, until he cut his hair. Ooh. Um, but uh, so in a similar way, you and me, we are strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. It goes on to say, put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. I want to make a couple of observations as we go through so we understand what's going on here. One, if we believe in the Bible's the word of God, and we do, there is a devil. If we believe in the Bible's the word of God, and we do, the devil's got schemes. And if we believe the Bible is the word of God, and if we do, God has given us the tools, the weapons to oppose the devil's schemes and to discomfit 
the devil, and because uh, discomfit isn't a very good contemporary word, take him down, obstruct his plans. And so what do we got? Let's take a look at a couple of these. Uh, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers in this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So, if you have a human that seems like your enemy, they're not the real enemy. They're under the sway of the devil, who is the real enemy. Verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may take your stand. After you have done everything to stand, now let me just note, having done everything to stand means you have confessed your sins before God, because sin is going to be an encumbrance against you being able to take a stand against the devil. Having done everything to stand means you, you bring your request to God, you confess your sins, you're in regular prayer, you're seeking God in his word, studying his word, you're, you're seeking God in your life. That's what it means having done everything to stand. And once you have done that, stand with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and the breastplate of righteousness in place. It tells us that, that these are defensive things. The belt of truth... The belt would have, in, in Roman armor, would have these leather things that protect your thighs and, and, and sorry, but your private parts. You've, you've, we've all seen in movies about Roman soldiers these kind of like leather thong strapped skirts that, you know, protect you from, from swords that are going to try to chop your legs and stab you where you don't want to be stabbed. So uh, the truth protects us. Righteousness is like the breastplate protecting us. Um... It goes on. So as we seek God's righteousness and obedience to his moral commandments, um, have your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You didn't want to go to war barefoot. You wanted sandals with strong bottoms in those days because they might put out little pokey things on the ground because so that when you walked over them, it would hurt your feet. And the gospel, our, pre our readiness to share the gospel with non-believers is a tool against Satan and his program. It's an offensive weapon. We're taking the battle to Satan. That's why it says your feet, because you are, when you share the gospel with non-believers, you are assaulting the kingdom of darkness. It's like, we're not waiting for him to come to us. We're coming at him. And so the gospel is kind of an offensive we weapon. It's our, it's our tough Shoes, uh, take up the shield of faith with which you may extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The flaming arrows are Satan's attacks that come at us, but our faith in God protects us from Satan's attacks. One of the attacks, he wants us to doubt God. He wants us to doubt his goodness, his reality, his word, and our faith in God protects us. And could you speak like doubting Yeah. Doubting our salvation, doubting whether God can really forgive our sin, doubting whether we're right with God after we've already confessed our sins, any number of things. And the shield of faith means we believe God's promises. Whoever believes in me, Jesus said, has eternal life. We believe in Jesus, we've got eternal life. Shield of faith. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Biblical promise. We believe that. Shield of faith. Um, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. When we believe that? Yeah. Uh, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. Now your head is a pretty important thing to protect. And our salvation is one of the most important defensive things. We recognize that we are saved and Satan can't take that away. And that is our helmet, recognizing what God has given us in our salvation. Uh, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Uh, the Bible is described, the Word of God, God's Word generally, which includes the Bible, is our offensive weapon, our main offensive weapon against, the, 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 against Satan. Knowing God's promises, knowing his truth from his Word enables us to what? Uh, not come under the sway of Satan's lies, because we know what the truth is. All right, and, and verse 18, we are studying prayer, so it's a good thing we kept reading. 
and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Oh, how wonderful. I didn't even have that in my section on praying for other believers. And there's a passage about it. So part of our spiritual defense is what we're talking about, praying for other believers. And this way we can pray for each other. Think about it this way. Um, in warfare during the time of the Roman Empire, especially Roman warfare, the way the Greeks fought and the way the Romans fought, you were dependent on the guys on either side of you. It wasn't like, you know, we see some movies about sword fight, and we like in Lord of the Rings we have Aragorn, and it's him and his sword, and he's surrounded by 20 orcs. That wasn't like Roman warfare. Roman warfare, they had what was called a phalanx. A bunch of guys next to each other. And what you did was your shield in your left hand protected the guy next to you while you had your spear, and the guy next to you had his shield in front of you. Everybody working together to defeat the enemy. So the Romans, one of the reasons they were so effective in their battles is because they might be going to war against these barbarian hordes like Germanic pe people from Germany or France, and I'm not saying German people or, or French people are barbarians, I'm just saying the Romans thought of them that way, but they might have these big, huge, gigantic swords and axes, and they just go running into the Roman army, swinging their swords and axes, trying to get at them, but the Roman army is like this wall of shields and spears, protecting each other because everybody's working together. And when we pray for one another, it's like we're all working together to defend ourselves as God defends us and defend one another from the attacks of Satan through, through prayer. Uh, verse 19, I want to say this part real quick, and then, uh, and then I thought I saw a question, but uh, pray also for me. I'm, that was the Apostle Paul wrote that, but I just want to say, you know, <laughs> pray also for me. Okay. Holly, was there another question? Okay, well, that's a, you know, my answer to that one is God bless you. Um, man, <laughs> I actually knew an answer for once. Just kidding. All right. uh, I think I've got one more pat, one more thing I wanted to talk about about praying for one another, and then we'll uh, and then we'll come back to a few other things next week. Um, we just talked in Ephesians about about praying for one another. One of the ways we should pray for one another, and one of the ways that Andrea and I pray for everybody who goes to this church. Almost every day, if not every, I don't want to, I don't want to overstate, but we, we try to regularly is that we pray for you and hope that you will pray for us to grow spiritually. We don't just pray for people being sick. We do pray for that. We don't just pray for financial provision. We do pray for that. But we pray for one another that we will grow closer to the Lord, that we will grow deeper in our understanding of who he is, because this is what we all, every believer needs. And uh, the book of Ephesians in particular is full of all of these prayers of the Apostle Paul for other believers. And I just, let me just, I'm going to kind of close by reading this prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesian Christians and for gener all Christians generally. And to suggest to you this is kind of how we should be praying for each other. I am in Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. And the Apostle Paul writes talking to his audience, but also talking to us, I believe. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope for which he has called you and the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is the fullness, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. 
And I, I really hope that there's somebody out there is praying that way for me. And, and I just want to encourage us all to pray for one another. Pray that we'll know him. Pray that we'll know the riches of his grace, his glorious inheritance. Know the gifts, understand the gifts he's given us in his salvation. That he'll help us to understand his wisdom and revelation. To, to know what he wants us to know. To understand his word. To understand the hope for which he's called us. Our hope is... Our hope of salvation that he's given us, that Christ is going to return and we're going to be resurrected, resurrected and spend eternity with him. So let's, uh, let's pray for one another to understand this stuff. Go ahead, Holly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. Because we know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever we said, whether it be a mistake or not. Yeah. Excellent bit of uh, interpretive work there, Holly. Thank God in the United States of America we don't have slave and master situations anymore. Huh. Not not legal ones, anyway. Not, in, not anymore, and the anymore there is important. But we do have jobs. Some of us do have bosses, and we do need to seek to honor the Lord in these relationships. And, and so excellent observation. That ain't always easy, but it, it helps a little bit when you remember. I mean, I think about some of the really difficult situations I've had with different jobs over the years. When I was working for Labor Finders, which is a temp labor company, not all that long ago, Labor Finders on Saturday, preaching sermons on Sunday morning at High Point. I was doing that a little bit. And, uh, you know, or I would, you know, labor finders in the morning on Wednesday, Wednesday night Bible study in the evening, basketball with the boys or whatever. Um, some of those bosses on some of these labor jobs were, were real nice guys. Some of them weren't. And when they weren't, goodness, is it helpful to remember, yeah, I'm not doing this for them. I'm doing it for him. Um... You know, the Bible tells women to uh, submit to their husbands in Ephesians as well. It's, it's... Husbands aren't always easy for, for their wives to submit to. Sometimes, they're, sometimes they're very, they can be very difficult men, and it's the same thing. Don't do it for, don't do it for them. Do it for him. The Bible tells children to obey their parents, and, and they need to. But I don't know. I had parents, and they were wonderful, but I didn't always have an easy time to obey. But if I had the mind of Christ, and I'm not going to say I did, the mind of Christ would have told me, even if... Uh, even if I really think dad is wrong, dad's dad, and he says, I need to obey. So, good good thinking, good stuff. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, and you, you, you gave the, the biblical. Yeah. Yeah. Don't. Uh, and, and and I and I do want to say as a as a parenthesis. Don't go on dates with those ones. <laughs> <laughs> Be nice to them. Pray for them. Don't go on dates with them. All right. With that. I think we're done with the study tonight, so uh, we will tie that up, have more next week, and we'll